Our topic for tonight, we're going to be talking about peace, power, focus on the rook. We did the knight two weeks ago, then we had a lesson on the bishop last week, and now we're looking at the rook. So uh, theory slash concepts we're going to be covering. We're going to be talking about the open file. Major pieces require an open file in order, I'm good at spelling, in order to come into play. It is very important to occupy an open file, or at least to control it. It is often the struggle for a single open file, which determines the whole strategic course of a game. Why is it so advantageous to control an open file? The aim is to penetrate to the seventh or eighth rank of the major pieces. From there, the rooks or queens can attack from the side. Either the opponent's king or his defenses, pawns, and other pieces. If this is not possible, if, for example, all the squares are well protected by the defending side, then the control of the open file theoretically serves no purpose. Yeah, we can't do a lesson on rooks without talking about open files. We're also going to mainly focus tonight on rook against two minor pieces. So this is quite an interesting imbalance, which we'll talk a lot more as we get to it. But a brief description. Situations in which one side has a rook plus one or two pawns in return for two minor pieces are very hard to evaluate and to play. The evaluation of such position often depends on positional factors. Then we also talk about some combinations involving files. This is more of our tactical stuff. I have this nice long description, but I'm too lazy to read it. So let's get started. We switch over here. So what is your thoughts on Rook against two minor pieces? You got any knowledge? Any uh, I do have a little bit of knowledge on this. I personally prefer the two pieces. But I always prefer two pieces over, like I said, rook and bishop over a queen. You know, I'm that kind of person. <laughs> but um, so I know, like, uh, the minor pieces are better than the rook um, if there are no open files or very little files for the rook to, to be active. And mm -hmm. they tend to be better in a middle game where you can attack because more pieces is more attacks. Yeah. Units, no, well, okay. Your two pieces they can attack the same thing twice, right? And a rook can only attack yeah. something once. Okay. We can no. defend something once. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is true. And I think that sums up about most of it. I mean, I think in almost every case, two pieces against a rook is just the two pieces are flat out better. It's when you start throwing in a couple of pawns here and there, you know, that it starts getting yeah. more vague and unclear. I have compiled some general rules here. So our first rule is in the middle game, two minor pieces are stronger than a rook that you did mention. And in the end game, the rook gains more power. It's not to say one rook is instantly better than two minor pieces in the end game. It's just that the rook gains a lot of strength. So the rook plus one pawn can be better than the two minor pieces. The pawn structure plays a decisive role in the valuation as well. Okay. And then we talk about how the rook, okay, if the rook's better in the end game, exchanging pieces is going to give us an advantage because we would rather be in the end game. And also it's easier for our rook to infiltrate when there's less pieces on the board. A pass pawn can be of enormous benefit specifically to the side of a rook. Because often if you have your rook behind the pass pawn, you throw the pass pawn, you can gain a lot of space. It's usually easier for the side of the king and rook to stop the pass pawn, unless the king is also supporting that march of that pass pawn. It is easy to coordinate a rook with its king, but a rook needs open files. This, again, you did mention. We need files so we can actually get active. Side of the minor pieces, it is important that these pieces possess stable squares. Often you'll see in these type of end games, the rook gains tempo by tempering either the knight or the bishop. And then... If a side of the minor pieces can blockade the opposing pawns, then his pieces will obtain some good squares and he often gets an advantage. I was always taught when I was like first learning about peace sacrifices that the one piece you the one thing you should be willing to sacrifice is the exchange. Don't sacrifice anything else but the exchange. Because then you still have a piece. And I think that yeah. kind of applies to this situation because we have two pieces. So if we can get our two pieces working really well, then they will definitely be better than our opponent's singular piece. If our pieces can't get good squares, obviously that's not going to be the case. And then the last little tip, but which I think is going to come in handy, if each player has only three pawns on one and the same wing, okay, that's a weird way that I've worded this, but hey, then the player of the rook can only have justified hopes of a draw. If he doesn't allow any obvious weaknesses in his pawn structure, when the player's on both flanks, the strongest two minor pieces to possess are the bishop pair, 
Whereas if the player is on one wing, then two knights or a knight plus bishop are more dangerous than the bishop pair. Why is that? Uh, because the, the bishops can hit both sides of the board. Okay, but specifically, why is then the bishop pair not as good if it's just on one side? Uh, because you just sack your rook for one bishop and they can't promote a wing pawn if you sacrifice it for the correct color bishop. I mean, that idea does come into play, but like if it's, let's just say three pawns on each side, if we, we use our imagination. I have three pawns, you have three pawns. Either you get two nice blue bishops and I get a blue rook. If we just pretend I'm not blundering my rook. Like the, the idea of sacrificing the rook for the bad bishop could like come into play at some point. But immediately, it's not too relevant. Why are the two bishops less good than, say, a bishop and a knight? You know, if you can't beat them with the question, try to, like, confuse it, them by wording it weirdly. So <laughs> the primary reason is because the two bishops, you can't attack the same thing twice. That's Oh, uh, yeah, that's true. So yeah. with a knight and a bishop or two knights, we can kind of double up on the pawn or something like that, whereas we can't do that with our two bishops. So, okay, we're going to look there at a few know. examples and hopefully see some of these rules applied in action. So Leko against Kramnik, our starter off for the day. So this position is black to move. What are our initial impressions? You know, I, I love the bishop pair, so um, <laughs> um, I immediately like black just because of it. But like you said, you can't attack the two pieces at the same time. Okay. Um, yeah, fair enough. I mean, the, the play is the on both sides, right? So the two bishops. Yes, yes, good. yes. So I'm not a contributor. I can't do arrows. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a your black bishop's under attack, right? And as I mean, let me make soon it as you move it, he's gonna bring his. Can I do that? Oh, you're not here on the Leech study. Yeah, I'm pretty, pretty yeah, intellectual. No, no worries. No. Uh, I'll just, I'll just speak in coordinates. So the rook is attacking uh, the d2 bishop, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so as soon as you move the bishop, he's gonna move his rook to the seventh rank and hit your bishop along there, right? So my obvious move is bishop c3 to defend the, the um, g7 pawn when you have to move the bishop with the next tempo. Okay. But I think after that, black runs out of tempos and white can maybe try and start bringing his bishop, like let's say, to, to, to g6 and down to b1 and start attacking those pawns. And there's so many arrows we can't possibly lose. So... <laughs> Yeah, I think, okay, that is definitely a very accurate assessment. The two bishops are, I think, quite comfortably better, yeah? As you mentioned, we do have to play bishop c3, but once we secure our weaknesses, play should be fine. What do you think the plan is for both sides? Okay, you did mention the one plan of bringing the bishop to b1, which pressures the a pawn. Yeah. Is there any long-term plans for either side? Um. I'm sure for, for, for black is to try and target, try and create weaknesses in the pawn structure on both sides and target both sides with these bishops. Right? Mm. Oh, okay. Uh, and white's plan? That's as far as. Um, I'm sure to try and create a pass pawn on the king side with his pawn majority. Okay. And try and neutralize the bishop using the pawn. Yeah, no, that is def. White's ca only counter players through that kingside majority, so we are going to have to use exactly. it. Let's see how the game plays out then. So I do have the note here. Black can protect his kingside very well if he's dark square bishop, which has the safe f6 square. So one of our prerequisites for the two pieces being better was that we have good squares. It's very easy to yeah. find good squares for our bishops, and the position is clearly better for black. He starts with bishop c3, white really doesn't have much of a plan so he just plays rook d3 bishop f6 and now f4 going with the plan that we mentioned the we need to use our pawn majority bishop g6 rook d1 we bring the rook back to d1 so that b1 is controlled and the bishop can't come to b1 h5 is played 
to prevent g4. Black understands what white wants to do. And also black is in no hurry. White activates his king. We get bishop to c2. Rook d2 and bishop b1. So already now what we make the assessment we made in the initial position, we've seen the bishop come to b1 and we've seen white try to get started with this pawn side majority. King f3, a5, and now g3. Why does he play g3? Not too sure, actually. Um, I don't think H4 is ever a real threat. Yeah, we don't want to fix our majority, right? So G3 feels a bit weird, but there has to be some reason. And who's playing this? This is Leko against Kramnik, right? So Peter Leko. Some people have heard of him. Mm. Well, the only reason I can think of is if you play H3, they play H4, and then you're, you're, you're. Yeah, exactly. He's playing G3, so he can play G4, which, okay, may sound mm. stupid because he can read the pawn two squares, but if he plays H3, H4, and now our pawn majority is not getting rolling, and it's quite a sad time for us. So yeah, g3 is purely to prevent that. So g3 is played, bishop c3, harassing the rook. The rook comes to e2 and bishop f5. So this whole maneuver by black now is to prevent us playing h3. White's plan was to play h3 and then g4, and now we can't because that bishop is being pesky and the threat of bishop g4 winning our rook. The, this is mm -hmm. why I really do like the two bishops versus the rook is because you can gain so many tempos on the rook Using yeah. two bishops like this. No, even if you think about as when you learn to play chess, they tell you don't bring your queen out early. And like okay, usually new players, they don't listen at all and they're like, hey, queen can attack things. But then you get to the point where you realize if you bring your queen out too early, everything just attacks your queen. And every time your queen gets attacked, you have to move it. You know? Yeah. It's the problem of having valuable pieces. So again, white decides to activate his rook, rook e7. And black just activates his king. So black has now completely stopped white's plan. There's no real way for the white king to come into the game. So black just simply plans to bring his king into the game. King e2, bishop f6, trying to chase the rook away from the seventh rank. Rook e3 and king c5. And now the king is just going to march up to a3 and help target the a2 pawn. King d2, king b4, king c1, king a3. Wow, it's almost as if I saw this game before. <laughs> now the rook comes to e2, has to defend passively. And already the moment you start being forced to go passive with the rook, things often can go bad. Now black plays a very nice move, a4, creating two weaknesses. We all know about the principle of two weaknesses. It is very difficult to defend two weaknesses. He takes a4, king takes a4, rook e8, and king to b4. Looking to target the c4 move, the c4 pawn. Rook comes to h8, again, just trying to harass black spawns. g6 solidifies everything, hits the rook. Rook h7, c6, and rook c7. Bishop e4, the whole position gets stabilized. And after h3, the c4 pawn drops. Okay, and let's now take a quick reassessment here before things get out of control. So now black's plan is going to revolve either around pushing his c pawn or picking up the a pawn and then running his two pawns. White's plan hasn't really changed. He just needs to find a way to get his majority going. He chooses to do that of g4, h takes g4, h takes g4, and now c5. Black starts trying to get his passborn going. White brings his king up, b5, rook f7, bishop c3 check, king comes to e3, and the bishop comes to b1. Now there's the risk of these two passborns. White really doesn't have a way to save this pawn, right? If a3, just king b3. And even if we defend passively with the rook, bishop b2 is going to pick it up. So we get pawn to f5. So now the counterplay is finally coming for white, but uh, it's already way too late. And we also see that the player is still on both sides of the board. 
So this is where our bishops are loving life. G takes f5 and g5. This is his whole idea, but simply after b4, g6, pawn to f4, a nice little discovered attack seals the deal. Yeah. I was about to say, like, you're even almost half prepared to sacrifice one of these bishops for this pawn. Yeah, it, the position's almost so good you can get away just, like, taking a bishop off the board. But, yeah. yeah. Obviously yeah. not necessary. This is quite a nice way to finish it though, the discovered attack, because off the rook check, then bishop d4 comes with check yet again. And even if you try to sack the rook now, then he takes back with the pawn and still check. So yeah, and 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 even if it wasn't check, if you had the move to play uh g7, just play rook to h7 and you're sorted. Yeah, and then <laughs> bishop, bishop h7. h7. Well done. And yeah. there's well, never any g7. problems. So okay, this is a Lekker honestly made this look really easy against Kramnik, and Kramnik's quite well known for having very solid defense. So yeah, I think Kramnik black. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that is true. Yeah, this Lekker guy sucks. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I mean, I think we can take away from this that almost in all situations, the two bishops is going to be better. There's this nice yeah. phrase. I can't know. It's like a phrase in Latin that like means all else being equal. My economics book always tells it to me, but I can't remember it now. But uh, let's move along. People sending me messages. I'm sure they're all begging to come join the chess. Okay, nobody is. What a surprise. Um, okay, next position. So immediately, yeah, uh, some things are different. So black has a, a few more points. Yeah, two, two more points extra. So he technically has a material advantage. So what is your assessment of this position? Now, if it was a middle game in this position, um, with two pawns, I would still prefer white, right? Okay. So two pawns make it a lot more scary. Yeah, no, that is true. Like, you get cases where... Remember, we, I don't know if you were listening when I made my great introductory speech where there was the discussion that positional factors often play a part. So there is positions yeah. where like the two pawns are just useless. Like we could imagine those two pawns back on their starting squares aren't really having an impact. Yeah, the other pawns are kind of bearing down. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I'd, I'd probably prefer black, yeah, but by very little. I mean, like it's still, it's still a tough position, you know? Um, he's okay. got a knight, which is makes it a lot more tricky. Yeah, fair enough, and I think that is probably the right assessment. When I first saw this position, I honestly thought it would be more easy for black. I think I looked at the bishop on d2, and I feel like it's difficult for white to coordinate his pieces. That bishop is kind of awkward. I don't really like any of white's pieces whatsoever. But your assessment, I think, is more correct. There are ways to coordinate them. Yeah, the problem I have is, like, like for example, one of the biggest moves that stand out for black is just, like, d4. Um, and as soon as, like, you exchange some pawns, the bishop starts coming lively and okay. more squares open up for it. Yeah, no, that is true. I think maybe b4 might be black's primary idea. I think b4 can also come. But any of those yeah, pawn breaks. Yeah, you play a5 and b4, yeah. yeah. Eventually, the position is going to open up and the bishop will play its part. But okay, let's have a look. So, black already at the start chart, I think he could go ahead with just a5 and the caveman approach, but he chooses to bring the king in because he clearly attended my lecture on activating the king in the ending. King f2, king e6, bishop e3, and that rook f8 check. Going a little bit passive yet to try and defend the that, So hmm? That's another thing um, about rook versus 2-1 pieces is um, rooks can sort of create a, a cage for a king. And you can cut um, off the example, king. Yeah. Yes, yes. Whereas 2-1 pieces struggle to cut off a king. Yeah, I mean, there's always as you know, I'm sure you know how to mate with knight and bishop, where you have to kind of create yes, the wall yes. and get the W going. Yeah, but it requires a king as well, you know, so. Yeah, a lot of it comes down and to... And I know two bishops can it. create diagonal types of walls, but mm -hmm. it, it takes both pieces, where it, he can take, just use one rook to keep your king out of the game for a while. 
No, fair enough. I mean, that one rook, that one rook is like both his pieces, though, right? <laughs> like, yeah. So. Yeah. But there is some sort of value to, to add to it is that you can cut off. Yeah, no, I, definitely. That is one of the reasons the rook is stronger in the end game, right? Because usually in the middle game, unless they think they're Nigel short, the kings shouldn't be going anywhere. So, okay, he goes rook f8, which, okay, Yusupov annotated this game and he was saying rook c8 is better because more active or something and gave a line like this. Where, okay, he says black is better, but we don't want to get too much into the subtleties today. Rook f8, just act putting the rook on the file. And after king e2, he plays king d6 to protect the pawn. So now white needs to try and find a way to get his pieces active. And he goes with knight h5. So now I want to, we can quickly look at something. Is g5 an option for black? You can do some calculating. G5, eh? Well, obviously, if he takes, you play rook f4, uh, yeah, rook f5 and win a piece, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you win a piece, though? It's tricky because he's got knight f4, uh, no, no, he doesn't. 38 checks. Uh, you're talking about ideas of, like, h4 to defend the piece. Yeah, I mean, I don't... Let's see. Let's put things on the board. You Calculating like hard. Four and and you lose a piece. Okay, so how are we losing? Right, you play. Okay, what H four? What are you saying? H four. H six. H six, and you're saying the piece still drops. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's probably true. And 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 there's no sneaky fork with the knight, like trying to play. And is uh, bishop f4 check ever relevant? Uh, bishop f4 check. Oh, yeah. That's true. I didn't see that check. I was trying to look for all the knight checks and trying to see if I can fork. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it's not... Bishop f4 doesn't end the discussion much. Because no, the knight no, is no, still no. hanging and the bishop's attacked. And, like... Yeah, you just... So, like, you move your king and then... Then we just win a piece. But you have to be careful where do you move your king to? Because obviously, if you move it to a knight checking area, yeah. Dead. So I'd say you just move your king to c6. Mm, you, you don't have to think, right? Yeah. But I think there's still more to that position. Mm, check king c6, and there's always more resources that sometimes surprise us. King of three. Now. You're saying my rook's trapped. And if you take the knight, the rook is trapped. So I'm just a very little tricky line that does exist here. Which. Okay. And black does lose the pawn. I think there's another. I'm trying to remember. But I remember what these variations were. I think. Yeah. H4. Does this work? I think this does still work yeah after h6 now we still go bishop f4 and we get basically the same thing so an interesting line interesting line that okay it's not super relevant i don't think g5 is on too many people's radars but is something that should be calculated in the game rook f7 boring moves g6 is also playable i believe maybe even better who knows all right comes back to f4 D4, C takes D4, C takes D4. And okay, obviously the bishop is overloaded. He can't grab on D4, so he has to drop back to D2. Now black decides to hit him with G5. And it comes back to D3. And now G4. Okay, let's again try to assess the position here. So we still have our two pawns. How have things changed since the starting position? Has anything changed? Do you like yes. next door or what? Um, I, I sort of like what Black's been trying to do. He's trying to create two past pawns for the pieces to have to babysit. Okay. Um, he's sort of created the D pawn uh, that, that's now still it's blockaded by the knight, but at least you have one piece blockading now. Now you 
Now you're going to create a post point on the king side and try and pull either the king or the bishop that side. No, yeah. yeah, and black is trying to make progress. It's very clear. Yeah. yeah. His previous move, though, has kind of, I think, given white a bit of a chance. So one of the things we talked about is the piece with the side of the two pieces very much would like to blockade. As you mentioned, the knight yes. on d3 is already blockading. Pushing the pawn to a light square now allows white to blockade off the bishop. So, yeah, I was just about to ask about that bishop f4 check. Yeah, and when you see it, it becomes quite appealing. Because, okay, let's just say king d5. Let's put the bishop now on g3. Now our pieces gain solid squares. And the whole idea of this line, did I enter this? No, I didn't. Wait, how does, I'm sure I have a variation somewhere. Maybe I have it later. But basically, the idea is that there is very much no way for black to come in. So, okay, mm. if he ever brings the rook to c7 or to the c-file somehow, without hanging his rook, we'll just play king d2 and there's no progress. If the king ever tries to come in, okay, let's just say king up, let's go king here. If the king ever tries to come in via f3, there's this very nice maneuver of 91 and the pieces coordinate to keep the king out. So this could have been a defense that White, unfortunately, didn't find. Maybe he missed the idea of 91 and just might have thought the king was infiltrating. I have a question. Is yeah? rook to f3 ever a possibility? Mm, yeah. Which position? Do you want to do it here? Well, one of these positions. Okay. I mean, you can put the rook on f3. The question is, does your rook on f3 do anything? Well, the immediate threat is just to take the knight. Take away to chop the knight, yeah. I think the problem is I do this. I'm just slightly annoying, right? And yeah, you just move your king back out yeah. and then he moves it back. Yeah. And the point is that white is kind of just setting up some blockade. Fortress, so fortress yeah. Putting the pawns on white squares isn't desirable. And this is, I think, a mistake that White has this chance a few times in this game, but he doesn't take advantage of it. With this great power of hindsight, the best move would have just been h6, which, okay, which... It's always interesting, these endgames, because there's the two school of thoughts. You put your pawns in the light squares that your opponent can't attack them, or you rather put the pawns on the color of your opponent's bishop so that you restrict the bishop, which, yeah. okay, is better if it can be done, but if your pawns all turn into weaknesses... Don't blame me. So, okay. In the game, though, g4. White decides to come with bishop h6. This is to artificial mechanically stop the h pawn from pushing. King comes to e6. Knight c5 check. Again, it, uh, white has this chance to go for the bishop f4 maneuver instead, which he doesn't. King comes to f5. Knight comes back to d3. Taking this is not too much on the menu. At least for now. Yeah. We don't want to hang yeah, pieces. Yeah. I did I did notice that. <laughs> rook comes to c7 and king d2. We need to keep this rook out. We in our introduction about open files, we did discuss that if there's no way to penetrate on the open file, the open file for all purposes is useless. But black yeah. has a few open files, so he has a lot of hope still. Rook comes to c6, bishop comes to g7, targeting the d pawn. And this, okay, yeah, the note from Yusupov reads, white gets his priorities wrong, the default pawn is blockaded, and less important, the real danger is threatening on the king's side where white should not give up the blockade. So he's yeah. saying this idea of bringing the bishop to f4 is very crucial, and even at the cost of a pawn, he thinks it's necessary. So yeah, we see h5, bishop takes d4. Now it's just one pawn, so material is now equal, but black has the more active king, and he has the potential for a very quick pass pawn, which as we discussed is very beneficial for the side of the rook. Um hmm? yeah. Yeah, it's just what I ask is King isn't King E4 like a massive threat now? Because after King E4 and you move the bishop and then rook then D6. Can't you... Right? Yeah. So yeah, this is again where your tactics always come ahead of strategy. You can have the greatest strategical plan and things don't work out for you. Tactically, it's all garbage. However, this has been calculated. King e4, and he goes bishop c5. And he holds mm. it together, maybe temporarily, maybe it's slightly stretched. 
just and, for the turn, yeah. Yeah, I think this is also... Because the... you just need the turn to move the king here. Yeah, no, that is true. But this does give Black the tempo to get his king in. And it's probably the reason that Black was so, shall we say, enthusiastic to give up his pawn when he could have tried to hold it a bit longer, at least. Now he just goes h4. He says, okay, you can have my pawn, but I'm going to make a pass pawn and get a queen. King e2. Now he's unpinning. And a5. a5 is played to kind of fight against White's idea of trying to play b4 and at least solidify his bishop. Then he only has to worry about the king side. Now he has to worry about both sides. Knight f2. King comes to d5. Pawn to b4. Securing that bishop. g3. H takes g3 and h takes g3. So knights are often very bad, as we talked about the other day at stopping. We talked about rook spawns, but I guess there's positions where they're not so great at stopping knight spawns either, because there's less squares mm. they can utilize. Knight comes to g3, a takes b4, and the bishop drops back to e3. If we take with the knight, we might think we're getting a nice fork, but okay, this position is definitely lost for us. Yeah, yeah, you just win that, yeah. Yeah, that should be relatively straightforward. And if we take with the bishop, I think rook c2 is the problem. And okay, if we block with the bishop here, then say a king d4. And we're too tied up. This pawn is too running too quickly. This pawn is falling and it's very hopeless for us. That's why he goes bishop e3. He's now trying to prove that the doubled pawns aren't twice as good as a single pawn. They're just as good as one single pawn. Rook c2 check. The king comes to d1. Now black does repeat moves quickly, maybe because of time trouble, maybe because of other factors that we're not aware of. King e4. He again goes knight c5 check. The king comes back to f5. And now knight d3, and they agree a draw. Not today, though. He chooses to go mm-hmm. king d5. Black is very much in the interest of winning this position. Knight d3. Rook c2 check. King comes back to d1. And now rook h2. And okay, the white pieces now, they've lost their stable squares. There was that position where we were dreaming of our blockade with the knight on d3 and the bishop on g3. That is long since gone. And our pieces have no good squares. Bishop comes to g1, desperately trying to defend. Rook h1 with this maneuver now of knight f4 and knight to e2. Again, getting very passive. The king comes into f3. And white now chose to resign in view of who plays king d2, rook h2 is a nice way to end the game. So, okay. Yeah, we've seen now a situation where the two minor pieces have been better, and now we see a situation where the rook is better. So it definitely depends on those circumstances we mentioned at the start. Let's look at one more example of this, and then we'll move on to some other topics. Okay, so this position is black to play. I would like us to take... Maybe a minute and let's come to some evaluation of the position. I see Hannah and Haggai have joined us. Nice to have you guys here. We are focusing on rook against two minor pieces at the moment. If you guys did miss the start of the lesson. I will maybe review some stuff a bit later. But this position is black to play and we want an assessment of the position. Uh, this is very difficult to to play because um obviously black has a lot of weak back squares because um obviously bishop takes d5 immediately loses to rook to e8 checkmate yeah yay <laughs> we can see so, tactics uh you have to first um deal with your back rank which involves you pushing a pawn and then it's actually two rooks. White is two rooks on the board versus a rook and two minor pieces. Um, which I still probably favor the two minor pieces, but he does have options of trying to force this uh, pass pawn down the board using these two rooks. Okay. No, I like that assessment. Anna and Haggai, you got anything to add?
Okay, I will take the silence as a no. Okay, you did mention the idea of trying to force the pawn down the board. I don't know if that is too realistic because I think that pawn is just going to be lost. So in the game, they start with king f8, and now this rook has to move, right? Because we are now, now the back rank ideas are a thing of the past. If we try something like rook to e5, how does this work? Maybe I haven't looked at this hard enough. How can I try and pick up this pawn? Maybe I just don't hurry. Maybe I just bring my king in with, let's say, something like king e7 and this pawn. I don't think this pawn is ever going anywhere, like realistically speaking. So my thoughts when assessing this position is we should probably start by just assuming this pawn is going to fall. If this pawn falls, how does that change our evaluation of the position, Rowan? Well, if the pawn falls, Blacks, I believe, is just winning. Um, okay. It's just so much easier for him to... But I feel like it's so much easier for him to, to play with the two pieces on, on one side of the board there and try and create weaknesses. And Yeah, and as we discussed like at the start, said, it's not the two pieces. Yeah, yeah, two pieces can attack one, yeah. one single weakness. So that is definitely true. But okay, I don't think it's as hopeless as you're making it out to be. It is definitely in the favor. White's plan should be to exchange the rooks, or at least exchange one of the rooks. So the reason he wants to do this is with the rook against bishop and knight, he at least has a chance. With the extra rook on the board, the attack is going to be a lot stronger. And I think in most positions where you have two rooks against one rook, you usually want to exchange change one there's some weird rules about that it does change there are other positions but it often can blunt your opponent's attacks whereas sometimes the two rooks get in each other's way but okay let's have a look at the game we get king to f8 the rook comes to d comes back to d1 he decides to give up the pawn now rather than later now we get rook to c1 and rook d5 there is a note you discussing bishop c4 which okay it really doesn't make any sense to voluntarily pin your bishop he's trying to keep the rook on to give himself more winning chances we do understand that the end game is closer to being a draw if the rooks come off however white's insistent he plays rook e to d1 either black needs to let him activate his pieces or he needs to trade the rooks he can goes with knight d4 he walks into a bit of a pinya, but he's hoping the idea of knight e2 is going to prove to be strong enough to compensate for this. White plays king h1, stepping out of these ideas. The king comes to e7. We get rook to c4, again pressuring the knight. Knight comes to e2, and we get the exchange that we've dreamed about. So now white has kind of achieved what he wanted, but it's still going to be a very, very difficult endgame. We already have this pressure building up against g2. And can I add a little bit to that? Yeah, um, go for it. White achieved what he wanted, but at the cost of moving his king to h1, which is a lot further away from the, the, the action that's going to yeah. happen. It is king, some time. Uh, Black's king. Yeah, no, the Black king is definitely more active. And I don't think there's any doubt here that Black is the one trying to win. Like, the, the hope of White winning was when the king was on g8 and he might blunder back rank. Now there's no hope of White winning. Rook comes back to c2, the knight gets chased, we get pawn to f3, and okay, black wastes no time and gets right into it of g5. He just wants to rip away this f3 pawn and get at the king. King comes to g1, trying to get in the game. As Raon mentioned, it was a bit misplaced. Pawn comes to h5, and king to f2. The king does start to activate itself and kind of finds a nice square. So there's another note here that talks about how Capablanca had a similar game. I should have honestly tried to find that, but I'm lazy. But he is not convinced that Black should definitely win this ending, but the defense is extremely difficult for White. Black decides to continue activating his king, just playing normal moves. A lot of these grandmasters, when they get these positions where they, they can't lose, they play very slowly because they just think their opponent's going to crack under the pressure. And it is very, very hard to defend positions like this when you're the defending side, because instinctively you want to do something active, and that isn't always the best defense. White brings his rook to try and get in the game. 
king to f5, rook d8, bishop e6. Black is just trying to coordinate these pieces. The rook comes to a8, knight d3 check, king e2, knight e5, and rook to h8, pressuring this h pawn. Pawn comes to h4, and now rook d8. So let's take another time out here. So how can black try to make progress in this position? We need to find what we need to do, and then we need to find a way to do it. Because, okay, we've brought our king up. Now our pieces are centralized on stable squares. But now we need to actually find a way to break through. How can we do that? And if we ever try to, like, advance our king more, we're just going to run into these annoying checks and be forced back. Um, we should try to block the rook's whole d file. And you want to block the rook from the d file. Okay, how do we do that? Do you want to play like something like knight d7 or bishop d7? Uh, knight d7. Okay, so your plan is now that you're going to block my rook and then you want to bring your king in. Is that the plan? Okay. Yes. So, but the problem is I can just move my rook to a different file, right? Like, let's say I bring my rook to a8. And now it's kind of hard for you to go and block the A file as well. We're running out of pieces to block everything. So I like that idea, but I don't think it's too practical yet. Okay. Mm. You got any thoughts, Rowan? Um, I, I've thinking like you have to try and create more weaknesses in his pawn structure um i was thinking about ideas of like h3 but he just plays like g3 <clears throat> and mm -hmm. it doesn't quite work out um okay yeah we, if we played h3 and he like pinky promised he would take it i think we'd be very very tempted to go down this track mm. so Okay, I think, but h3 does kind of appear to be our main break. So we need to find a way yeah. that when we play h3, he can't play g3. So the problem I have is like uh, every king move comes with some sort of check. Yeah, which okay, I think is why Hannah and Haggai had their idea of trying to block the d file, but doesn't quite work out. That is interesting. Um how about trying to make way for the f pawn? Okay. And we want to throw the f pawn as well. Let's just say we get everything we want. Let's say we go king g6. Let's say white does nothing. Let's say we go f5. And let's say white does nothing. I'm probably overlooking some nasty things like this. But... Okay, how do we want to break through? Now that we've got everything we wanted, how does it work? Because the problem is in these positions of three pawns against three pawns, trading pawns only starts to favor the defending side, right? Because that's one less pawn he needs to worry about. Maybe you could try to destroy his structure with those three pawns. Yeah. Oh, we would like to destroy structure. The idea is like h3. Okay. No, I think throwing the f1 can definitely make sense in some positions. The plan adopted in the game, I very much like. Very calm move, bishop d7. So it blocks the d file, which was the first idea we had. So maybe there's a world where king f4 is a useful move. But it also comes with another plan. It plans to bring the bishop to c6. Once the bishop is on c6, we threaten to go h3. So a very nice mm. way that black finds to break through in a position that maybe wasn't so easy to break through. So we get rook to b8, bishop to c6, the rook comes to b3. He has to defend passively. Now that rook is no longer active, black just slows it right down. He plays bishop d5, rook a3, and now h3. There's probably not much reason that he needed to include bishop d5, but what's the hurry? We get g takes h3. There is a line given of g4. I don't want to analyze it too deeply, but it is very much a defensive idea white could try. And off the king f4, play something like rook a4 and harass this king 
and there's some tactics going on here and it's not obvious how black is supposed to break through but i think there was ultimately a way but let's focus primarily on g takes h3 so now those weaknesses have been created black can now advance the king rook a4 check bishop c4 instead of us blocking the d file we block the fourth rank king comes to f2 now f6 f6 such a nice move hey just does absolutely nothing where do you want to go back to how much is a few moves is this a few moves uh one move yes after the white pawn takes okay. the h pawn okay and then black played king f4 yeah yes um yeah If white plays, if black plays king of four, mm -hmm. then the rook checks. Mm -hmm. Then the bishop checks on c4. Okay. And this is what happened in the game in king of two. Yeah, I do apologize if I went a bit fast, but this is what did happen in the game. Do you have another idea yeah, or did you just want to see it again? What if you played like O18 move on F5 to mm. F5? You're saying pawn to F5. The move played in the game was pawn to F6, which, okay. And this kind of creates a zoot swung position. I think pawn to F5 should also work. I think pawn to F5 does work. I'm not entirely sure. I might be missing something. But the idea of pawn to f6 is what is white supposed to do now? You can't keep the rook on the fourth rank because you get forked. And if you go to g2, you allow the king to come in potentially to e3. So what happens in the game is the rook is forced back to a3. Again, I think this is the same if we put the pawn on f5, except now maybe there's some variation where this knight is unprotected, which isn't going to harm us anymore. The bishop drops mm -hmm. back to b5, rook to b3. Knight d3 check, king to g2, and now bishop c4. It is still difficult for black to coordinate these pieces, even with all of this ongoing. We get rook to c3 again. Now the knight comes back to e5, rook a3, and it kind of feels like we're almost repeating until we get more and more pressure on this f pawn. Rook a4, and the king now has gained e3. You'll notice we had this position earlier, but with the king on f2. Now we get to use the e3 square. King comes up to g3, pawn to f5. And again, white does need to find a move. He chooses to just check. Our knight comes into the game. White now has to make a desperate run for it with h4. He wants to try to create a passed pawn, but g takes h4, king h4, bishop f3, and black's passed pawn is further up the board and better supported by his king. So in a few moves, white is forced to give up his rook and the pawn does fall as the king comes into the game. And okay, if you're playing this in a game, at least make sure your opponent knows how to mate with a bishop and knight, but these are grandmasters, so they should know how to do that. And when the knight comes to g5, obviously the pawn is blocked and you can just run the king to h5 and you'll win the pawn. So quite an interesting game, which... Yeah, this whole end game, I think you could study for a very, very long time. I think the key idea is just breaking up the structure and then trying to coordinate the pieces. Once this weakness on F3 is created, it gets a lot harder for white. Um, I, yeah. I wanted to comment on that F5 opposed to F6 idea. Mm -hmm. If you go down, um, the, the playing f6 rather than f5 gives you an extra tempo to keep the zigzag alive. Yes. Um, if, if you play f5 immediately, like if you look later down the line, um, where uh, go, 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 yeah, see, uh, you play f, hey, you kept the option of f5 to give himself another tempo move to allow that, um, white to stay in this position where you can't move yes yeah no and that's a lot of these pawn endings 
keeping the, I think they call a reserve tempo can often be very useful. It's a very nice technique from Black converting this. I like also that he understood when he sacked the pawn that he wasn't in any hurry to win it back. He just used the pressure and then he won in the end. So let's just quickly review our rules for this rook against two pieces and then we'll move on to some other stuff. So, okay, our rules quickly. In the middle game, two minor pieces are as a rule stronger than a rook plus a pawn and often stronger than a rook plus two pawns. So that's in the middle game. In the end game, the rook can get a bit stronger. And there's opportunities for a rook and a pawn to be even better than the two pieces. A lot depends on the pawn structure and positional factors. In general, the side of a rook gets an advantage from the exchange of pieces because they're okay, getting closer to the end game and allows the rooks to penetrate the seventh rank a lot easier. A pass pawn can be of enormous benefit to the side of the rook. The rooks belong behind pass pawns. The pass pawn can help disturb the coordination of the two pieces. It's easy to coordinate a rook of its king, but a rook needs open files in order to penetrate the opposing camp. We also talk about for the side of the minor pieces, it can be very important that these pieces possess stable squares protected by pawns. Otherwise, the piece is going to get harassed by the rook and they're going to have no rest. If the side of the minor pieces can blockade the opposing pawns, then these pieces will obtain some good squares and he often gets an advantage, as we saw in one of the games. And if each player has only three pawns on one and the same wing, then the player of the rook can only have justified hopes of a draw if he does not allow any obvious weaknesses in his pawn structure. In that game, we did see the obvious weaknesses in the pawn structure. When the player is on both flanks, the strongest two minor pieces to possess are the bishop pair, whereas if the player is on one wing, then two knights or knight plus bishop are more dangerous than the bishop pair. Because obviously, if you have a knight and a bishop, you can double up on one weakness. Whereas if you have two bishops, they can't attack the same thing. Okay, let's move. How much time do we have? Hmm. Let's solve a few exercises quickly. I don't think these are going to be too challenging for us. Then we'll move on to so maybe a couple of games and then have some harder exercises towards the end. So if we look at this quickly, this position is black to play. I'm going to give you guys... How much time do I need to give you guys? Let me give you guys 90 seconds to solve this and then we'll look at the answer. We'll just fly through these so I can get a break from talking and then we'll look at some other concepts. So it's black to play and find the best continuation. And the hag, I say no. It's a very interesting comment. Um, I think I've solved it already. You are speed. Yeah, I'm trying to think if you've yeah. seen this before. Like, we'll give like another 30 seconds for the other people to solve it, and then we'll look at the answer. You can maybe just make sure that you're not blundering your queen. Um. Mm -hmm. Yes, hi guy. There was an um. Okay. What if you check on e4? Check I on. wanted to check this variation. I'm not so sure about it. Okay, now, queen e4, and if I take yeah. your rook on h3, you play rook h6 check. Rook h6 check, and if I go king g3. And then it's not working so well. What was your idea? But queen e4 is the right move. It's queen e4, king takes, queen f3. Queen f3, and it's just a slight move order. Uh, now, obviously, yeah. we made. And the other option to look at is queen to g3, which still leads to the same mate. Okay. And if one move, you know, moves, it's the same idea, queen f3. What do no, there's a mating net. So, um, oh, yes, Hago. Can you go back a few moves? Mm, there's the starting position. What are you wanting to look at? Um, to the point after queen e4 check, then he takes the rook. 
then you play queen e then you play queen e3 queen, queen f3, f3. Sorry. Then, then you can you block block with the queen okay yeah not i think ron was mentioning this then it's yeah, still the same rakech. checkmate rakech six is still checkmate so yeah okay, okay. now these are a bit too easy but we'll fly through them quickly mm. okay this is way to play now i do have some harder puzzles towards the end which will challenge us a bit more i hope Um, rook takes b8. Rook takes b8, and after rook takes b8, um, rook to f8. Rook takes b8, rook takes b8, and rook to f8. And now you're dreaming that you're gonna mate me on b7, and everything's gonna be fun. Um, the problem is, I'll play something like Queen, where do I play? Do I play queen b6? Do I check on e5 maybe? At the very least, I can check on e5, right? Now what's your plan? Yes. No, no, no. Don't oh, yeah. Check on d6. d6. Yeah, and I pick up the rook. Yeah, and Thank you. pick up the rook. Yeah, I was just seeing there's at the very least a perpetual. But yeah, after rook f8, queen d6 is the rook. So we need to maybe think this through a little bit more. Isn't just a rook f5 to, to, to b5? Rook b5. I think this is the problem oh, wait, I was mentioning. The, there's the yeah, perpetual the, at yeah, least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was looking at the other, there's no other perpetual. <laughs> yeah, if you don't see the perpetual because in your mind you like hallucinate that the rook is still covering it. But yeah. It's actually an interesting problem because I would say this problem should be quite easy, but it's not like an idea you see too often. Um... What if you play rook takes f seven? Rook takes f seven. No, a a seven. A seven. Okay, and then after queen takes a seven. Then queen takes. Queen takes. King takes. Then rook a five. Rook a five, and it's very very close to checkmate, except it isn't. So, and we have problems, right? Very close though. Just need to slightly work out the subtleties and then we'll have it. I think it's made in three. I was thinking, I was thinking along the same lines at rook a7, queen a7, and then is it rook a5 first? Yeah, no All small right. subtlety. You can't take the queen. But then I was thinking, like, doesn't rook, does rook, no, rook uh, b7 doesn't defend, does it? No, mm. it doesn't, because you just take the pawn, take yeah. it with the pawn check, and the king has to move, yeah. Mm. You take up the For queen, some reason, yeah. I thought the queen could, or even just take it with the queen, yeah. Yeah. So, and it's basically the same position that we got in the previous variation. I just, I was yeah. just thinking rook b7 defends because for some reason I thought the pawn takes and then the you, you, it's not check with the king and the <laughs> queen can take and the king can come out. Yeah, uh, It's an interesting problem because this whole you naturally want to play the checks and stuff like that after sacrificing the rook 
but there's just no way to defend off the rook a5. Okay, now let's go through these last few ideas quite quickly. And then we'll get to the fun stuff. So this is white to play again. And I think given the topic of our lecture should give the biggest hints to solve the solving of these problems. Um, is it rook f4? Yeah, rook f4 is the key idea. We're talking about files and rooks. So initially speaking, it doesn't look like we have anything for our rooks. But then uh, rook f4. And the whole idea is if he captures, we're going to get this g file. Yeah. And, and mate then, is unstoppable. And if he ever plays king h8, you play queen takes f6 check. I mean, you can probably get away of playing rook g1 first, but yeah, queen takes f6 is the probably correct way of doing it. And if he chooses not to take this rook, rook g4 is just coming and the rook lift is deadly. Okay, nicely done. Let's look at two more and then we'll get into stuff. Or maybe I'll get bored, who knows? Got to keep everyone on the edge of their seat so they don't fall asleep. So this is black to play. I should have told people that. Makes it easier to solve the problem if you know whose move it is. Yeah, I'm trying to see how white gets out of this. <laughs> um, Queen, do you want to check? Queen d1 check. Um, okay, and if I go, where do I want to go? Let's just go king f2. Um, then you can play. You. Then you go back. I didn't see that. Yeah. And my king somehow weasels his way out of trouble. So maybe we need something with a little bit more potency. I'm thinking about like queen e1. Queen e1. Okay. Very similar idea. Doesn't come with check though. What happens if I do nothing? Let's say g4. So my idea is to come queen to, to, to f1 check. Queen f1 check. And now if I play king g1? Am I scared? Uh, you, at some point you should be because doesn't uh, queen e2 now work? Mm -hmm. Okay, queen e2 and now this rook is under a lot of pressure again. So and if I play f4, king f4, I lose to queen f2. Queen f2, yeah. Um, I think that does just work. Maybe even a... It does work, yeah. I think queen f1 works. Maybe even after this, there's some funny line where we can basically like, I don't know if we can go rook d1. I think there is like other ways of doing it. Just switch straight to kingside attack, rook d2 even might be good. 
But yeah, the, the key move is seeing that Queenie won. And with this double pin action going on, it's quite difficult for White to ever escape. Okay, very nicely done. All right, zoom through this last couple here. Ah, this one's boring. Let's go this one. This one's fun. Maybe I should hide the answers. This is way too black. And okay, this is more of a study-esque position. So we need to work out what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And if you think you see it in 10 seconds, you probably have the wrong answer. No, it's a the stalemate. <laughs> yeah. Right, the stalemate. He's talking about after rookie one, the nice discovered attack, king h2. If we go and take our free queen, this is kind of unfortunate. But the king is now stalemated. Hey. Um, king, quick, rook, g4, check. G4, check. Mm. Okay, now we have this discovered attack. Yeah, now it's just king takes h1. Mm, yeah, king takes h1, and okay, a bishop that's no longer alive can't hit. And, and he also has the option of going king h2 if he really scared he can keep the same stalemate idea alive if he really wants to. Can we? I think we can. Yeah, that's that's yeah, cute. Can Bishop takes. Can we? Yeah, we can. I um, guess. <laughs> Bless you. Oh yeah, we need something better. Tricky problem. I'll give you guys two minutes to come to an answer and then we'll look at the solution and move on. There is some other stuff I still want to cover tonight. Can there be like a line after rook e2? Then you find like a way to escape the stalemate. Mm, you mean rook e1? Yes, after rook e1, sir. You won king h2, and now you want to find a way to escape the stalemate. I don't know, that could be. If you find a move that convinces me, I'll be convinced. I mean, we can't take the queen. And. I don't know if there's any other options here that we're seeing. I was trying to look if I could checkmate the king in the original position with like king to g3. King g3, the good old caveman approach. Um, but the problem is like he's got two options of queen a3 and queen a1. Yeah. As, or even yeah, that adds a third option to it, Queen B. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of yeah. annoying checks, and I think he does just defend quite easily. The idea of Ricky one is right, but you need to find the one, one cool move. Again, this is a study position, so it's not a normal move. <laughs> um, is it bishop e4 yeah the curious approach right so again okay, we... yeah bishop yeah. e4 and there's just mate on h1 which is unstoppable 
And if he takes our bishop, obviously we just take back the rook. Any other bishop move, he's just going to take our bishop with his queen. And any other rook move accomplishes nothing. So, yeah, bishop e4 is the only move. That um, yeah. How about, like, if you try, if you try, for example, bishop to c6, then he takes with the queen. Now you're down a queen. Rook, rook, rook e2, mid. Mm. Oh. I have another row, right? Yeah. So, unfortunately, not going to work. Okay, those are just some interesting exercises. Make sure everyone's still awake. I think we do have time. Still to look at one more game, maybe. Uh, which of these games is more interesting? Hmm. I think it's like a Capablanca's game. I think it's a nicer game. I think if my memory serves me right, and I'm not confusing them. So Kappa Banka is playing against Trebol. So usually when you look at games like this and you've heard of one of the guys and you haven't heard of the other guy, usually the guy you've heard of is going to win because you've heard of him because he's good. I don't think anyone has heard of the player playing black. D4, D5, C4, C6. We get a Slav defense, Knight F3, E6, Bishop g5 is a little bit weird, but it is something that people do. Bishop e7, we get bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, knight bd2, and now f5. So black is going for stonewall pawn structure. That's the name given for this formation. White plays his pawn to e3. He's just developing calmly. Knight b knight d7, bishop d3, knight h6, castles, castles. Queen c2, pawn to g6, rook a b1. I am going quite fast through the start of this game. We will take a pause just now and assess the position. Knight f6, knight e5, knight f7. Again, black did choose to exchange his dark square bishop and place all these pawns on light squares. So that's probably not the best decision. White plays f4, bishop d7, knight f3, rook f d8, b4, bishop b8, Rook fc1, a6, queen f2, knight takes e5, knight takes e5, knight d7, knight f3, rook c8, and c5. Okay, now let's try to make some assessments on this position. So, okay, anyone got it? I feel any like thoughts? I've seen this game before. You should have. It is very much a classic. <clears throat> it's a very nice game, though, so you get to see it again. Hmm. Any thoughts on this current position, though? Yeah, um, Black's uh, bishop is looking very, very, very sad. Yeah, that bishop is going to need a CS psychiatrist. He needs some happy pills um, or something, but yeah, he is very stuck. Black's knight's best bet is to try and get away to, to e4, but even then you can just chomp it off with your bishop. Mm. Um there's no way that black can defend the dark squares for the white, uh, white knight to come in. And yeah, so that's that's okay. how I feel. I, know, and how I know this is on rooks, but then I spoke about minor pieces, but mm -hmm. that's what we're looking at at the moment. Okay, fair enough. Hannah and Hagar, you have any thoughts? Um, Hachi. Okay. White. White. White like has opened up a file. So if the knight moves and the queen moves, the rooks can like go to f1, then climb to f3 and <coughs> enter an attack on the king side. Okay. No, yeah, there is potential for a rook left. Okay. Yeah, I like that idea. I think when Rowan analyzed it, he mainly looked at the minor pieces. We are talking about rooks. So we potentially need to find plans for that. So what are some long-term plans? Okay, we have this idea now of this rook lift. Is there any other long-term plans in the position yeah. for either side? You could uh, push on the queen side like a4, b5. Mm -hmm. Trying to break through on the queen side. Are there any other plans? Potentially one more plan. I would say trying to do the same on the king side thing on the king side yeah yeah the position is closed you know the world is our oyster 
Black chooses to come with knight to f6, and white goes a4. Now he's planning to play b5. The knight comes to g4, the queen is hit, so the queen moves away. Knight h6, there is some weird maneuvers going on here. I think the plan is to go knight f7 and g5 at the moment. White plays h3, knight f7 and g4. So I like how white goes for both of these ideas simultaneously. He has this idea of pushing b5 whenever he feels like it. And now he's pushing g4. So he's gaining space all around the board. And I think generally, if you're playing a position and you don't exactly know what you're doing, just taking space can often be very beneficial. You watch Magnus play. You never see Magnus have a position like black as you. Magnus is always the guy for the space. I read this uh, book on space and they showed this game. That's how I know this game. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they, they said like, uh, most people think if you have the queen space on the queen side, your opponent gets the space on the king side. But the truth is you take all the space. Play on the king side, watch, and then take the space on the king side and the queen side. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, if you can get it, you definitely take it. Usually in getting that space, your opponent does something. Yo, Capablanca is, I think he's quite good at chess and he has a bit of a reputation. So his opponent might be playing a bit scared. His opponent is kind of just waiting around. He's now brings his rook to c2. You notice how he's cleared the second rank. Now these rooks, can basically just swing across to either side of the board. The king comes to h8, rook g2. Now he wants to flirt with the idea of opening the g-file. The rook comes to g8, he plays g5. Okay, I don't need the g-file. Now he's going to have the idea of playing h5. And there's still this idea of b5. Let's not forget about that. The queen comes to d8, he goes h4. He's now throwing, gaining more space. King g7, h5. The king does not want to be on h8 when the h file opens, so he's forced to run away here. Rook to h8, you get rook h2, queen c7, queen c3. Why does in no hurry? Now he's just mobilizing all these pieces for whenever he si decides to open the position up. Queen d8, king f2, queen to c7, and rook h to h1. He's getting ready to open the h file for a great kingside attack. Black decides, okay, I don't want to get full victim to this great kingside attack. So he puts his rook on g8. White just plays queen a1. Now there's always ideas of his queen swinging over back to the king side. There's ideas of his queen being active on the a file. The rook comes to b8 again. Queen comes to a3. Rook comes back to g8. So now Black is completely out of ideas. Black is just waiting. He is kind of at the stage where he's expecting the worst, hoping for the best. But he is now prepared, though, for the h file opens. Let's just say Capablanca decides to play h takes g6. After h takes g6, suddenly all the rooks are coming off on the h file, and okay, white has thrown away a large part of his advantage. So he just plays b5. He takes the space on the other side, as Rowan was saying. So all the space on both sides of the board, a takes b5 and h6. So this little intermediate check, he throws this in, not because he wants the king side closed. He would very much like to still have that idea of opening the h file because all these rooks are there. But it forces the opponent's king to come to f8. And now that the a file is open, black's pieces are not well placed to take advantage of that. We get king to e7, b6. Hitting the queen. The queen comes back to b8. White has now gained this outpost on the seventh rank. We get rook to a1. The rook comes to c8. Queen b4. He's obviously getting the queen off the file because he wants to bring the rooks in. The rook comes to d8. Rook a7. Infiltrating on that outpost. Remember we talked about open files. Open files are only worth anything if you can infiltrate on them. Otherwise, principally speaking, the open file is completely useless. Like, let's just say instead of a pawn and a queen, this was two bishops. Then you wouldn't be able to access that file. Okay, sure, my case probably isn't that great because we could trade the bishops, but hypothetically speaking. Rook a7, king comes to f8. Black is hoping his king is safe now on that side of the board where it's closed up. Rook comes to h1. Everything is coming to the a file. That's where everything's happening. Bishop e8, rook comes to a1, king comes to g8, rook to a4. What formation is white setting up here? 
the Alakan gun. Yeah. It's pronounced Ali Yekin, though, but I'll forgive you. Well, King of uh, I read it from <laughs> book. <laughs> no, the Alakan is the American pronunciation, so everyone says it like that. It It's the same, though. A lot of names like that, they don't really work if you say them properly in the English language, but yeah. Queen A3, now we have our Ali Yekin's gun set up. King comes to G8, King G3, White's in no hurry. Bishop D7, King H4. He thinks there's a chance that his king is going to be more active here. King comes to H8, Queen A1, King G8. Eh, change of plan. I think I like my king back a bit. King G2. White is in no hurry. Black is completely I think paralyzed. he's literally just torturing Black here. Yeah, I think he was sitting laughing <laughs> and, and playing this game. Uh, just having a good time while his opponent is like furiously sweating. Yeah. No, it, it shows that he understands the position, which I think is quite nice. Bishop e8, knight d2. Now that he's chosen a square that he's happy for his king, he now decides he needs to bring the knight over. Because, okay, this e5 square is a nice outpost, but realistically, black's knight is always covering it. Bishop d7, knight b3, rook e8. This maneuver is now so you can put the knight on d8 to defend the b7 pawn. Knight comes to a5, knight comes to d8. Now, how is white supposed to break through here? Now that we've kind of maximized all our potential. What is the killer move? Um. Uh, I'm not sure if it was uh, mm. uh sorry, yeah, what was that? This. Anna and Haggai, what was your mm. idea? Mm. Now everyone's muted. Sunny, uh, everyone wants to uh, talk. Let Rowan go first. Okay, let's hear Rowan's idea first then. Everyone being so polite. Uh, yeah. Um I have two I have two options. One was either the, the mission uh immediate bishop to, to a six. Because obviously, if he takes, you take his bishop. Um, but I think it was more the aggressive knight takes b7, followed by bishop to, to, to h a7. Okay. Um, does this work? Mm, if I go 98, I take the rook. Take the rook. No, I. Probably I'm not having the most fun at the moment. Yeah, I believe this does just work. Do I have? Well, I'm sure so the rook takes b7 so works. I'm sure. I'm sure anything on taking on b7 works. <laughs> mm. You go back. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 you're no, saying no, no, in the no, starting no, position. Yeah. Rook yeah. Takes, yeah. Rook takes b7. Probably as so works. <laughs> I mean, yeah. The position's so good. We're trying to find a move that loses, but we can't. In the game, he goes with bishop a6. Did I put any yeah. variations? It was one of those two. Yeah. I mean, I think like he just wants to find the easiest way to win. And bishop a6 is a move you can play with no calculation, right? Because after b takes a6 and rook takes d7, this pawn is weak. Yeah. If this pawn drops, the h pawn is going to become a queen. This a pawn is, you can write it off as dead already. Like, yeah. yeah, the book that, that I've read that analyzes game probably showed me all both those variations that I'm <laughs> confusing and I'm not sure which one was actually played. <laughs> okay, no, fair enough. Rook e7, rook takes d8, we get him sacking the exchange just to win the pawn back and get his exchange back and have a million pass pawns. So this was a very, very comfortable game. Like, I don't think there was ever a moment where White was worried. He completely controlled the game. He chose which files opened up. And he chose to open the files that mattered to him, right? And whenever he opened up those files, he made sure he was in complete control of those files. So I think it's a very nice demonstration of what we've been talking about with open files. Um, hmm, we have an awkward amount of time left, four minutes. Hmm, could run away early, or we can attempt to solve a problem that we probably won't solve in four minutes. Okay, this position, I think it's white to play. Yeah, it is white to play. This is a study position. So I have no hope of you people solving this in four minutes. 
but who knows maybe people will surprise me so at white it's white's move black is coming this way black is about to make a queen we would like if black did not make a queen so if we can find a way to stop that i think we'll find a way to solve our problem hmm Can we find any way to stop that pawn from marching? Check E8, look. Look E8 check, that sounds fun. If we check him enough times and he can't promote. Um, maybe he moves the king to F2. Rook h2. I'm going to go rook h2, and now my pawn is pinned. So that seems quite good. So I need to play a different move in the first situation. And I'm going to do that. I'll play king to d1. Um, In the rook to h2, don't you just go king g3? Mm, no. I think I can just take this thing. All right? Because uh, yeah, white's yeah, up true. way yeah. too much to begin with. Black's whole plan is he needs to queen that one. So I go king d1 instead, and I think the party is cancelled. We need something better. Actually, may maybe what I should do. How about I share the study on the WhatsApp group? I'll share the link as well as the notes. And then by next week, if you people can have this solved, I would be very grateful. So I think I will probably be here next week and I can judge if you people actually solve it. Is that good with everybody? Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's Fantastic, fine. Then. Thank you all for coming. I hope you got something out of the lesson and enjoyed your Thursday evening. I think I'll probably see you people again next week. Okay, cool, cool. thank you. Enjoy. Okay, enjoy your evening, everyone. Thank you for coming.